This lovely manhua is titled, My Obsessive Father's Heroic Homecoming. If you love stories like this, please like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you'll never miss the next episode. It was a sunny morning. Birds fluttered in the sky, chirping cheerfully. A young lady stood in front of her door, surprise etched on her face, and asked the young man to repeat what he had said. He replied, addressing her as, Your Grace, and politely asked her not to be formal with him. He bowed and delivered the message again, saying, Your husband, Lord Summert, has been honored for his great service in the war and has been granted the title of Grand Duke. So, she froze, interrupting him. It's true that I had his child, but I'm not his wife, she said, placing her hand on her chest with all seriousness and sincerity. Thinking back to that fateful night, Ella recalled the moment she learned her love had to leave for war. It was a night of the full moon which hung high and bright in the sky. Under a green tree, Cassius, the young man everyone spoke of, held on to her tightly. His eyes were filled with sorrow as he apologized, explaining that he had no choice but to go. Ella knew deep down that the chances of his returning alive from the brutal war were slim, and she couldn't stop the tears from flowing. Cassius, I don't want to lose you to the war, she cried, holding on to him with all her strength. The thought of him leaving tore her apart and she couldn't bear to let him go. Looking into her eyes, Cassius gently reassured her, saying she shouldn't worry. He promised her I'd come back alive and she should please wait for him. Oh, and look at how handsome he is. I just hope a handsome and charming man like this doesn't die in the war. Oh, and look at how handsome he is. I just hope a handsome and charming man like this doesn't die in the war. Caressing her face and softly calling her name, Cassius tried to comfort her. On the day of the war, he met Ella under their usual tree before leaving. With his horse on standby, he told her he would be back. With a sad look on her face, she asked, Do you really have to go? He replied, A conscription order has been issued across the empire, so I must go. As he put on his war armor, he added, There's no way I'm not going to the war. Ella looked down, her heart heavy. I know that, she said. She understood everything, but still wanted to hold him tight and tell him her secret. But she couldn't. Instead, she gave her best smile and told him to come back safely. It felt cruel to her to tell someone going to war that she was having his baby. So she watched, tears streaming down her face as the love of her life rode away, fearing he might never return. Eight months later, a young girl called out to Ella, who was holding a paper and crying. She asked, what's wrong? Is everything okay? Ella had just received a notice from the war about the deceased Viscount Cassius Summert. Oh no, this is so sad and I'm sure this will shatter her completely because what she feared the most has happened. Facing the reality of his death shook the resolve she had built up since giving birth to Greta. Mariah, Ella's younger sister, was holding her baby and her other two siblings were with her, looking sad and asking if Ella was feeling sick. But no one could understand the pain she was going through. They were worried about her because her body hadn't fully recovered after giving birth. She looked up at them saying she was okay as she crumpled the notice paper. She held onto her baby and managed to smile, knowing she was now a mother. So for Greta, her child, she had to be okay. Ella met a man who owned a shop in the market and told him she was looking for work. He sat there arms folded, glaring at her, and asked if she was really looking for a job. Look somewhere else, he replied coldly. Ella didn't leave. She looked down and asked if there was anything she could do because she was ready to do anything at all. On, poor girl, the man yelled at her, telling her to stop making him repeat himself, which drew the attention of passers-by and startled them. This man is a total piece of trash. He told her he didn't have any business with her anymore, so she'd better leave now. Ella left with people murmuring and whispering behind her. She was completely broken and shattered because finding work was really not easy, especially since she had a child. As if that wasn't enough, every little chance Greta got, she'd cry, asking her mom about her father. Ella was in a tight spot and couldn't even answer her own child. With Cassius's death, the Summert family's only son, Greta, became the sole heir. And if this truth were revealed, they'd definitely take Greta away from her mother. That's why Ella kept it a secret from everyone. Ella would hug her daughter whenever she asked about her father and say, even if you don't have a father, I'll love you enough for both of us. With tears in her eyes, she'd tell Greta that she'd protect her no matter what, so all she had to do was stay strong together with her. Whenever her mom said these words, Greta would shed tears of joy, smiling and hugging her mama tight. 
Even when it was hard to breathe, Ella pushed on, but the world kept giving her endless trials. With the loss of both her parents, she couldn't help but cry whenever she went to their grave, wishing everything would just end because she was already so tired. Meanwhile, on the other hand, the war was over and the soldiers were rejoicing. Cassius happened to be among them. Is he not dead? Then why did they send a notice to Ella saying he was dead? This is crazy. They owed the victory of the war to Cassius. One of the soldiers walked up to him, bowed, and asked him to treat his wounds and head to the quarters to rest. But Cassius grinned and told him there was something he had to do first. Someone is waiting for me. I must go at once, he said. Ah, oh, she's been on his mind throughout the war. Imagine him coming back to find out he has a child. There was chattering all over the kingdom as people rejoiced happily. When a man asked what was going on, he was told that the nobles from the capital were visiting, and among them was the hero who led them to victory in the war, the Grand Duke of Heilwig. Everyone cheered as his horse entered the empire. Ella and Greta were among the crowd. Greta pointed out to her mother that someone was at the front. Ella asked who it was, and Greta replied that the people said he was the Grand Duke of Heilwig. Ella was shocked, realizing that the lover she thought was dead had returned after seven years. Wow, returning from war after seven years? Ella, it seems your prayers have been answered, or should I say your wish has been granted, it has finally come to an end, right? Ella sat in the living room with Greta asleep in her arms, while Mariah read a book across from her. Ella looked sad and lost. Mariah noticed and asked what was wrong, saying she looked like she'd seen a ghost. Ella sighed and asked, what would you do if someone you thought was dead came back to life? Mariah, folding her arms, said it depended on who the person was. If it was someone she loved, she would be happy to see them, but if it was someone she hated, she'd be upset. Ella continued, what if it was someone you loved, but they weren't there for you when you needed them? What if they came back too late? She was struggling to move on, and now that he was back, she didn't know what to do. She wondered if he was still the same person from seven years ago, why he hadn't sent her any letters. And if she could really tell him that he was Greta's father. Well, this is really confusing, you know. I bet anyone in her shoes wouldn't know what to do, because it's really complicated. At the Summert Manor, Cassius was in his room, putting on his garments with a sad look. He turned when he noticed someone was there. It was Gunther, a young man with long hair and glowing eyes, sitting by the window with his legs crossed. Gunther wondered aloud what kind of woman made Cassius leave the luxury of the capital to return to this remote place. Cassius, glaring at Gunther, replied that her name was Eleanor and that he should use her name properly. Gunther laughed and said, Fine, Ella, then. He got up from the window and sat beside Cassius. He remarked that Ella didn't seem happy to see him at all. Cassius, who was wiping his sword, froze as he remembered Ella's shocked expression and how she had quickly picked up a child and left. He felt deeply sad. He continued wiping his sword and explained that Ella was just shocked because she thought he was dead. Gunther smiled, suggesting that maybe the Countess, his mother, only said he was dead to keep him from chasing Ella. He then asked about the child, causing Cassius to glare and clench his fists. Cassius replied that the child was probably just someone Ella was working for like a nanny. Gunther leaned in and asked how Cassius could be sure the child wasn't Ella's. Gunther got closer, asking how Cassius could be sure that the child wasn't Ella's. Cassius, his anger rising, insisted that he knew the child was not Ella's. Gunther stepped back, saying he'd stop because Cassius's stare was too terrifying. He then asked, You're a dragon. Can't you see who she belongs to? Just watched how Gunther remained speechless while blooming a flower with his magic, smirked, and Cassius questioned, saying he thought he figured it out already. Back at Eleanor's residence, she had just put Greta to sleep when a knock came at the door. It was Mariah who informed her about a visitor. Ella, puzzled, asked, A visitor for me? Her confusion deepened when she saw Countess Summert standing at the door, calling out her name softly. Hmm, what is she doing here? What brings you here, ma'am? Ella asked, her voice tinged with surprise. The Countess, Cassius's mother, replied that she hadn't come to trouble her, but merely to talk. She had previously been hostile toward Ella, even offering her a bribe to stay away from Cassius. However, after receiving the death notice, the two shared the same grief and pain on that fateful day. Since that day, 
Ella and Countess Summert had only exchanged brief greetings when they happened to run into each other, and the Countess had never visited her before. I wonder why she's here now that her son is back, or she's come to bribe her again not to show her face to him now he's back. Mother-in-laws can be dramatic, you know. Ella wondered if the Countess was here because of Greta or Cassius. The Countess began to speak, saying she had something important to discuss about Cassius and felt she should be the first to tell Ella. Ella, puzzled, held her teacup tightly as she listened. The Countess explained that she too had believed Cassius was dead, just like the other soldiers. Ella gasped as the Countess revealed that during the war, he trembled while fighting a soldier and fell off the hill, ouch. Who would have survived this kind of fall? She had suspected this because the death notice had mentioned he died from a fall and the canyon was known for the dragon's lair. Ella asked what happened next. The Countess explained that Cassius survived by making a pact with the dragon, which was why he had been missing for four years. He had spent two additional years on the front lines, and his valor had earned him the title of Grand Duke of Heilwig. Ella, still in shock, suddenly yelled in frustration, saying that if Cassius had survived, he should have at least sent her letters to let her know he was okay. That's right. He should have done that. Why didn't he? The Countess squinted and explained that the letters were misdelivered. Ella, rising to her feet in shock, asked for clarification. The Countess confirmed that the addresses were incorrect and the war had disrupted their administrative system, making communication with other territories nearly impossible. The Countess then dropped her teacup, revealing that Cassius didn't know about Greta. Ella was stunned, realizing that the Countess had known all along Greta was Cassius's daughter. Well, she'd be dumb if she didn't know that because she of all people should figure that out. But then why didn't she help Ella all those times? She ignored her and left her to Carter for her granddaughter all alone. So cruel. Reaching out to Ella's hand, the Countess explained that she intentionally kept the truth from her son and ensured no one else revealed it, believing that Greta's parentage should only be disclosed when Ella felt ready. I don't like this woman. I doubt she has changed. What do you want to do, dear? The Countess asked, holding on to Ella's hands gently. Ella was so moved by the Countess's words and actions that she couldn't help but thank her, even though she was still unsure of what to do next. She hesitated, torn between revealing the truth to Cassius or keeping it a secret a little longer. Ella finally spoke up, telling the Countess that revealing the truth about Greta to Cassius wouldn't be wise. She thought to herself that since the Countess had once wanted her separated from Cassius, she probably wouldn't want Greta and her to appear in his life now. If she spoke rashly, who knows how the Countess might react. The Countess smiled and said she understood Ella's decision. You shouldn't be in a rush. Both Cassius and I will wait as long as you want, she reassured. Ella thought to herself that keeping Greta hidden was the best choice for now. It was a sunny day and Greta was running around excitedly, exclaiming about how nice the weather was. As they arrived at her workplace, Mr. Taylor, holding a cup of tea, welcomed them cheerfully. I just happened to have a picture book ready for Greta, he said. Greta smiled and thanked Mr. Taylor, which left a beaming smile on her mother's face. I'll be working, so stay close and be good, Ella said to Greta. Okay, Mama, Greta replied. Greta sat with Mr. Taylor, who was sitting across from her, reading a book as well. Meanwhile, Ella was arranging the study books, but she couldn't help glancing back at her daughter and feeling glad that she could bring her to work. As she reached out to pick up a book, Mr. Taylor started a conversation. Have you heard the news? He asked, looking up from his book. Ella turned to him, a little curious. What news? Mr. Taylor continued. Who would have thought Cassius would return and with such great honors too? Isn't that amazing, Ella? He then added, you used to be close with him, right? His words made Ella freeze. It's been seven years, though, Taylor went on, giving her an unfriendly glance. And now you have a child. There's no chance of you rekindling anything with him, I believe. Ella felt her hands clench at his words. He continued, you shouldn't use your past relationship to trouble him. Ella's heart sank at his harsh words. This man? Well, any elder would probably say the same. After all, they don't know who the father of their child is. Ella turned away, lost in her thoughts. No matter how kind they seemed to Greta and her, she knew the villagers all thought the same thing. She doesn't know her place, just a baronet's daughter daring to be with the young lord. They never missed a chance to call her shameless or remind her how her father was a retainer of the Somert family. 
and she dared to aim for the Viscount? Poor Ella, her life was so sad to begin with. It was closing time for Ella, and she was done for the day. She thanked Mr. Taylor and asked Greta if she had finished the book. Greta replied happily, saying she did. Ella held her daughter's hand, telling her they'd stop by Edwin's place before heading home. Greta replied, saying how good that sounds. On their way, Ella was shocked to see Cassius and his men standing in front of the draper's shop where she had worked seven years ago. She wondered why he was standing there. Seriously? Is she seriously wondering why he's standing there? Come on, baby girl, he's there for you, isn't it obvious? One of Cassius's men called out to him, saying they should head back because they came here by the Emperor's grace. But they were already running out of time, and they needed to resolve the title succession and return to the capital. Cassius stood there quietly, despite the pleas from his men to go, because it was time. Looking at Cassius, Ella could remember him waiting for her with flowers behind him whenever she closed for work, but look at him now. He's changed so much, she thought. Greta called out to her mother, asking if they weren't going home. Ella replied, saying they were, and was turning away to go, but was called by Cassius. He saw her. She stopped, still facing her back to them. Cassius asked if it was really her. She turned to see him, thinking to herself that his eyes were still the same. It's been a long time, he said, waving. He stepped toward them, apologizing for making her wait for so long. Greta flinched, holding on to her mother tighter, and Ella replied, saying it was fine, but she had to go now. As she dashed away, Cassius was heartbroken, calling out to her to wait, but she didn't stop. He drooped sadly, asking if that was all she had to say to him. Ella froze in her tracks as Cassius shouted, asking if that was all she had to say to him after he had been gone for seven years. He tried reaching out to her, saying, Is this all you have to say to me? Ella glanced at him, apologizing, and saying, I really need to go home now. Greta stared at Cassius, and he scowled at her, asking Ella who the child was and if she had become a nanny after the draper's shop closed. Ella replied, That's none of your concern. Greta went closer to Cassius and said, You look so shiny and tall. On, that's so sweet. Ella was surprised to see her daughter approaching him like that because she was always shy around strangers. But why was she acting this way now? Cassius, staring at Greta, was taken aback by her comment. You look so sad, she added. He leaned towards her, smiling, and said, his not sad, but happy. Greta tilted her head and said, that's wrong, he actually looks sad. She then turned to her mother and asked, Mama, can I give the gentleman a candy? Cassius froze, his eyes widening as he heard the little girl call Ella, Mama. He looked up at Ella with a sorrowful expression and asked, What's going on? Ugh! Things are getting more and more complicated. Cassius called out to Ella, his voice filled with confusion. Ella responded by saying she needed to go home first and that she would explain everything afterward. All right, it's late. Let's go together, he replied. He's going with her? His men standing behind him called out, asking if he was returning to the castle. You must hurry back. Time is of the essence. Whoever she is, we don't have time for this. One of the men said rudely, causing Ella and Greta to hesitate. Cassius turned to them angrily, making them all flinch and step back as he asked, What did you just say? Your grace, the man stammered shakily. Cassius glared at the man, his eyes intense as he said, Watch your mouth. She's not someone you can talk about like that. The men immediately bowed, apologizing. Better. Cassius turned back to Ella and sighed. I'm sorry about that. Should we go now? He asked. Ella thought to herself how much he had changed, but that kind smile of his was still the same. Before they got to her place, it was already dark. Sophia was sitting and reading when she heard a knock on the door. Sister, you're back. Why are you so late? Edwin was waiting for you, but left, she said as she opened the door. She instantly gasped at seeing Cassius. My Lord! She exclaimed in shock. From behind, Mariah asked what was happening, only to be stunned herself on seeing Cassius, too. They both bowed, welcoming him, and Mariah congratulated him on becoming the Grand Duke. Cassius smiled, calling them by their names, and said, It's really been a long time. You remembered our names? Mariah asked. Of course I do, Cassius replied. You're Ella's sisters. He turned to them, asking if she lived here, too. Sophia and Mariah exchanged glances but didn't say anything. Ella stepped in, saying she would handle the matter, and asked Mariah to take Greta inside to change her clothes. I'll take care of dinner later, she added, asking them to bear with her. As Cassius left, he glanced back, thinking to himself if the child really was Ella's daughter. He clenched his fists. 
Cassius dismissed his men, telling them he had business to attend to and they should return to the castle first. Though fidgety, they eventually stepped out. With arms folded, Ella asked if he could just dismiss his guards like that. He snorted, explaining they weren't his guards but the Emperor's spies and that no one in the world could protect him from them. He looked into her eyes as he spoke. Ella, observing how he had transformed into a Grand Duke with such remarkable achievements and a powerful dragon contract holder, felt that he had indeed become someone else. She stepped away from him and asked if they could take a walk. Under the full moon, he followed her from behind. As they walked, Ella said, As for Greta, she's indeed my daughter. Cassius froze, completely shocked. Hey, seriously, you should have seen this coming. It was pretty obvious. Cassius staggered, struggling to believe what he had just heard. He had imagined this scenario many times and had promised himself to accept whatever choice Ella made, even if she didn't choose him. He had resolved to let her go with a smile, despite the pain it caused him. Throughout the war, thinking of Ella and writing letters to her were the only things that kept him going. He had resolved to respect her choice, no matter how difficult it was. But deep down, he knew he truly wanted to keep her by his side. It didn't matter to him if she had a husband and a child. He longed for her presence, despite everything. Ella flinched when Cassius didn't immediately respond. Cassius? She called out, worried about his lack of reaction. She wondered if it was okay to tell him. Gathering her courage, she said again, Greta is my daughter and your daughter too. Yes, she told him. Everything will fall in place now, right? Cassius was shocked. My daughter? He repeated, thinking about how Greta had approached him and complimented him. The realization that she was their child filled him with unexpected joy. Cassius said sadly, Ella, you've been raising her alone for seven years. He bit his lip, his heart aching. He added, I'm back now, so you don't have to worry from now on. Ella called out to him as she replied, Greta is indeed your daughter, but you shouldn't come back. Huh. Well, it's not like she'll easily take him back after seven years. That's a whole lot of time, and to think she's raising the child alone is really not easy. She told him she knew he'd had a hard time in the war, but she'd been without him for seven years. No one could compensate for that lost time, and Greta and she had found stability. Telling her now that her father was alive would only confuse her. But Ella, I... Cassius began, trying to reach out to her. She cut him off, asking, Are you staying here? Cassius froze, realizing he needed to return to the capital to settle the succession. But the title and power the emperor gave him were nothing compared to Ella. He grabbed her shoulders, asking if he should stay. Would that be enough? If I stay and be a proper father to Greta, can we go back to how things were? He asked. I wonder what her reply would be, because I think she already prepared herself for this moment. Ella hesitated before grabbing his hands and saying it wasn't possible. I'm seeing someone else, she admitted. Someone else? Who could that be? It was morning, and the sunlight reflected in the room through the open window. Ella and Greta were lying on the bed, sleeping soundly. Suddenly, Sophia burst into the room, pushing the door wide open and calling out to Ella. Sister, sister, she called out. Seeing Ella still in bed, she gasped, asking if she was still asleep. Ella rubbed her eyes as Sophia asked if she had stayed up with Cassius last night. Ella replied worriedly, asking what was going on. Sophia said someone was here to see her. Ella was shocked to hear they had received an imperial decree. When Ella got up, she found a young man outside, surrounded by imperial knights. The young man at the front read out a royal decree from the emperor. Lord Cassius Summert has been honored for his bravery in the war and has been granted the title of Grand Duke of Heilwig. However, the young man continued, Lady Eleanor has not received a proper title. Therefore, the Emperor grants Lady Eleanor the title of Grand Duchess. He read out, Wow, Grand Duchess, they say. Who told them Cassius is married to Eleanor? She can't possibly receive that title when she's not married to him. Ella and Sophia were shocked to hear this. As if that wasn't enough, the young man told Eleanor that she had to come to the capital urgently to formally receive the title. He snapped his fingers and another knight stepped forward with a box of sparkling jewelry, saying, The Emperor has sent a gift to the Grand Duchess. The knights bowed, shouting, We greet the Grand Duchess, the Grand Duchess of Heilwig. They all bowed deeply. Ella was confused and called him Sir, asking if they could repeat what they just said. The young man bowed, insisting she didn't need to be so formal with him. Ella shook her head and told him she couldn't be the Grand Duchess. She explained, 
It's true I had his child, but that doesn't make me his wife. The young man was taken aback and asked what she meant. Ella replied, That's exactly what I mean. We didn't sign any marriage documents. Her statement left all the knights in shock. She turned away, saying, There's no need to call me Grand Duchess and you shouldn't be here, so you better leave. The young man was surprised and started to speak, but before he could finish, Ella froze and turned back to them, saying, the Emperor must have thought I was Cassius's wife to grant me that title, but I'm not his wife, so His Majesty's decree is invalid. Turning away, Ella entered her home and advised them not to waste their time here. She told them to return to the capital immediately and inform the Emperor of the truth. She glared at them, throwing a glance over her shoulder and said, You better take the gift with you. With that, she slammed the door. The young man groaned, thinking to himself that she truly was the woman Cassius loved, and not an easy one to deal with either. He turned away and one of the knights asked if they should inform Marchioness Ornier. The man lamented, How could we report this after things turned out like this? Marchioness Ornier said this was the last chance. He said anxiously, What is going on now? Who's this Marchioness Ornier and what is her deal with our Eleanor? The knight explained that Lady Eleanor was their only chance to change the Emperor's decision about the Grand Duke. The young man quickly hushed them, warning that even in the countryside there could be people listening in. So they should be careful. They apologized for their carelessness. The young man suggested that they return to the Marchioness for the time being, and they started to leave. He thought to himself that there was still some time before they had to go back to the capital, so he needed to find a way to convince Lady Eleanor. Ella reached for the window curtains and watched the group leave before turning back into the room. Sophia was excited and told Ella that the visitors called her the Grand Duchess. She dreamily talked about the beautiful jewels and suggested that Ella should marry Cassius. But before Sophia could finish, Ella stopped her with a loud yell. Ella put the meal on the table and said she did not want to marry Cassius. Sophia tried to say something, but Ella interrupted her again, saying she would not do it for Greta's sake. Just then, Greta called out to her mother from behind, Ella and Sophia looked at Greta, who asked if the shiny men had left. Ella opened her arms, telling her daughter they were gone. Greta innocently asked why they were there and if they came to see Ella. Ella lifted Greta into her arms, assuring her that everything was taken care of and there was no need to worry. She then suggested a visit to Uncle Edwin, which brought a happy smile to Greta's face. When Ella confirmed their plans, Greta chuckled with delight, promising to bring lots of candy. Ella agreed, sharing her daughter's excitement. Meanwhile, Sophia watched them with a hint of sadness as they held hands and left. Later, with a basket brimming with food, Greta and Ella arrived at the clinic, eager to share their treats and enjoy a visit with Uncle Edwin. They knocked on the locked door and Edwin called out that he was on his way. He put on his coat and walked to the door, curious about the unexpected visitors, as he didn't have any appointments scheduled for that time. Upon opening the door, Edwin began to ask how he could help, but his words trailed off as he recognized Ella. His face brightened with a warm smile. Ella glanced up at him, asking if she was interrupting. Edwin quickly reassured her that she wasn't and mentioned that he didn't have any appointments until the evening, so she was welcome to stay. It had been over four years since Edwin moved into this house. Initially, the place felt empty and cold, but everything changed when Ella arrived, bringing warmth and life to their home. Edwin went to the corner of the room and prepared her favorite tea, serving it with a warm smile. Ella expressed her gratitude and took a sip, savoring the comforting taste. As she enjoyed her tea, Edwin observed her quietly, cherishing their bond. With a gentle smile, Ella expressed her belief that Edwin had become an essential part of the village. The village lacked young men, and Edwin's presence as a young and skilled doctor made him a perfect fit for their community. Edwin sat down on the couch, looking down as he thanked Ella for her kind words. He admitted that he still had much to learn. They exchanged glances for a moment before Ella presented a basket of fruits that Sophia had prepared for him along with apple jam as she knew he was running low. She also mentioned that Maria had returned the book she borrowed, expressing her enjoyment of its contents. Edwin looked really sad as Greta watched him holding a cup of tea. Ella pulled out a letter, mentioning it was from Evelyn, but before she could continue, Edwin interrupted by calling her name. She glanced at him, and he told her that he had already heard the news. Well, of course you should have. He's in the village, after all, and it's really close to her. 
Ella was left speechless as Edwin continued saying he heard she was going to marry the Grand Duke of Heilwig. Okay, let's go back to how Edwin came into the village. Come to think of it, what is her relationship with this man? Three years into the war, the village head had lost all his laughter and energy, and there wasn't a single young man left. Then out of the blue, Edwin appeared, his footsteps echoing through the quiet village. The villagers gathered in hushed whispers, one woman asking what a young man like him was doing in such a remote place during wartime. Another man replied dismissively, no one cares, at least we need every healthy young man we can get. With an innocent smile, Edwin introduced himself as a student doctor who was still learning but willing to help them. Ella bowed down in gratitude, thanking Edwin profusely for his kindness. He modestly responded, scratching his head and insisting that it was just his job. Ella, feeling overwhelmed with gratitude, expressed her deep appreciation for Edwin's selfless care of her sick mother throughout the year, without ever asking for anything in return. She struggled to find the words to express her thanks, bowing down in reverence for his generosity. As Ella's mother approached her final moments, she called out to her daughter, encouraging her to repay Dr. Edwin for his unshakable kindness and support. She emphasized the importance of expressing gratitude and cautioned Ella against failing to do so. Ella, feeling the weight of her mother's words, agreed with a sincere, yes, mother. In the days that followed, Ella's mother sadly passed away. Throughout this difficult time, Edwin remained a constant source of comfort and support, never leaving Ella's side. Sitting down with her basket, Ella shared that it would be impossible for her to marry the Grand Duke. With her daughter by her side, she told Edwin he knew where her heart lies. Blushing and laughing heartily, Edwin expressed his delight upon hearing her decision. Turning to Ella, he invited her to visit the garden if she had the time, sharing that he had planted new flowers. Greta, captivated by the idea, eagerly asked if she could join them, to which Edwin warmly replied that she was more than welcome. Overjoyed, Greta giggled with excitement. Under the bright sunny sky, the garden was alive with vibrant colors and the gentle rustling of leaves. They were both seated, enjoying the tea with Greta on the other side, staring at the beautiful glowing flower in front of her. On, seems our lady is nervous here. She kept munching her biscuits and Edwin used a wipe to help her clean up. It feels like a dream, he said, smiling. Being here with you and Greta on such a sunny day is wonderful. Edwin looks cheerful, but then why do I feel like Ella is not? What about you, Ella? he asked. Ella, who was eating a biscuit, was shocked when Edwin wiped the particles left on her mouth. He couldn't help but exclaim how happy he was to be there with her and Greta on such a sunny day. What about you? he asked. She looked confused as the breeze blew her hair, making her remember her mother's words on her sickbed. Her mom had told her never to forget Edwin's kindness and to make sure to repay him in the future because if she didn't, it would be considered ungrateful. Ella suddenly smiled, saying that she loved having this beautiful time together. She added, You had a new book for Maria and the face cream Sophia wanted and the flute for Evelyn, who loves music. He asked her to take them home with her, and she replied with a considerate expression, saying he didn't have to. He looked away, smiling, and said she shouldn't worry, it was nothing. So she simply said, thank you. Oh my, this guy is really doing a lot for her already. I doubt she's ready to leave him and marry someone else when she knows that what he's doing is definitely out of feelings or love. Okay, I don't know, Ella was back home with her family sitting aside with Mariah, sewing with thread and needle, while the others were checking out the gifts Edwin had for them. Ella called out to Sophia as she sewed, saying she hadn't been going to her house lately. Isn't Hans feeling neglected, she asked. Sophia, who was holding a mirror in her hands, turned and replied exhaustively, don't even get me started. My husband has been so busy these days. Mariah, who wasn't really interested in the topic, threw a glance when Sophia mentioned the young master being back and how busy everyone at the mansion was because they were preparing for the ceremony. Sophia lamented as if she might cry, saying that with him back, there was so much to do. The Marchioness Ornier will attend the ceremony, and the summer estate is in chaos right now. Mariah paused on the cloth she was folding and replied, I see. Greta suddenly dashed in, calling out to her mama and saying that she was ready to go. Evelyn turned to her, asking where she was going with Greta since it was her day off. Ella opened her arms wide for Greta to come and hug her, saying they were meeting Edwin at the square. Sophia blushed and remarked that the two of them had always had a special connection and that they had been meeting more often lately. Ella, holding Greta's hand as they approached the door, said, 
It just so happens that they both have the same free time, she added with a hint of sarcasm. Are you kidding me? A man will always find free time when he's interested in a lady. As Ella and Greta stepped out of the house, a sudden downpour took them by surprise, with rain pouring down without warning. Realizing their umbrella was at home, Ella quickly grew concerned for Greta, who might catch a cold. Scanning her surroundings, she noticed a vacant building ahead and recalled that it had been empty for months. Scooping Greta into her arms, Ella hurried towards the building, thinking they could wait there until the rain stopped. Upon reaching the door, which creaked open as she pushed it, Ella carefully set Greta down and leaned in, promising to find something to keep her warm. Searching through the counter, Ella recalled seeing something that could provide cover when she first entered. She found it and returned to Greta, wrapping it around her and telling her to keep warm. Greta, looking worried, asked if Uncle Edwin would be okay without an umbrella. Ella smiled reassuringly, saying he was probably sheltered somewhere like they were, and that they would leave as soon as the rain stopped. As the rain continued to pour and thunder rumbled, Greta cried out, saying she was scared of the thunder. Ella immediately hugged her, assuring her not to worry because she would protect her no matter what. The door suddenly swung open, revealing a young man silhouetted against the rumbling thunder behind him. Isn't that Cassius? What is he doing here? Pulling Greta closer as the cold breeze from the open door chilled them. Cassius, flicking his wet hair back and closing his eyes briefly, apologized for not realizing anyone was inside. He explained that the rain was so heavy he had come in for shelter. When he opened his eyes and saw Ella, he was equally surprised. Both of them called out in surprise, marveling at the coincidence. Cassius stood there, dripping wet, as Ella handed him a cloth. It may be worn out, but use it to dry off, she said. He hesitated to take it, prompting Ella to ask what was wrong. She slid the cloth into his hands, wondering if it was too shabby for him. Cassius wiped himself off slowly, his voice tinged with sadness as he admitted he thought she wouldn't want to see him anymore. Ella was taken aback, asking where such a notion came from. Turning away, she reassured him, I don't hate you, just dry off. You look like a drowned rat. With that, she and Greta settled on the floor as Cassius took a seat at the table. Greta, noticing Cassius's gaze, glared at him and demanded, Why are you looking at my mama like that? Cassius looked away, surprised. Greta blocked his way and told him to stop looking at her mom because it made her sad. Cassius apologized, looking sad himself. Greta noticed his sadness, but insisted that she didn't like seeing her mom upset. Ella quickly intervened, saying Cassius wasn't trying to hurt anyone. There was an awkward silence until Cassius finally spoke, asking if they were heading to the square. Ella said she had an appointment and asked why he was in this part of town. Cassius hesitated and then admitted he had hoped to see her again. Ella was confused. She wondered if he had been wandering around since their last meeting. She then reminded him that he should be preparing for the ceremony. Before Cassius could respond, Greta excitedly shouted that the rain had stopped and asked if they could now visit Uncle Edwin. Ugh, this girl. Cassius stopped and asked who Edwin was. Well, gentlemen, with all due respect, I don't think you should be asking that. She's not going to tell you even if you ask until tomorrow. Ella clung to her daughter, saying it was none of his business. She then froze, looking at him and asking if he was the person she mentioned the other day. The one you're seeing? Cassius asked. Ella tightened her grip on her daughter's hand, ready to leave. Like I said, it's none of your business, she replied. He and I aren't in a relationship, but we do have good feelings for each other. She started to head out. Seriously, she's even explaining, oh my, she really likes this guy. If her feelings for him had faded, she wouldn't be explaining. She'd just let him think whatever he likes. What about your feelings for me? He asked. I saw that coming. He asked her if her feelings for him were really gone. She turned angrily, saying she didn't think she needed to answer that, and slammed the door behind her, leaving him standing there, looking sad. Ella! Edwin called out with a smile. Greta ran towards him, hugging him to the ground. She asked about what was in his hands. Edwin, beaming, explained that since it was raining earlier and they didn't have an umbrella, he got one for them. He handed it to Ella, who was shocked and couldn't help but thank him. As she took the umbrella, Ella remembered her mother's advice to repay the doctor and uphold certain duties and responsibilities. The thought of these duties kept echoing in her mind. Meanwhile, with Edwin still smiling, she asked if they should head out now. On a sunny day, a group of horses approached Ella's house. She was in her room reading with Greta when there was a knock at the door. 
Glancing over, she wondered who it could be since she wasn't expecting anyone. She opened the door and asked, to whom do I have the pleasure of addressing? Standing there was a young lady in a uniform who apologized for the intrusion. Ella took in the sight of her from head to toe and thought a woman in uniform, not a dress, carrying herself with such authority could only be the Marchioness. Ella was surprised and immediately bowed, greeting, Welcome, Marchioness Ornier. The Marchioness then asked if she was Eleanor, wondering if they had met before. Well, I think she's asking this question because she hasn't met Eleanor before, but she identified her immediately at first glance. Ella replied that she hadn't met her directly, but had heard about her visit, so she assumed she was the one. Marchioness Ornier was surprised and smiled, thinking to herself that Ella was smarter than she had expected. Let me introduce myself properly, Marchioness Ornier said. I'm Marchioness Lisbeth Ornier, and I serve the Emperor. Ella listened attentively as the Marchioness continued. Marchioness Ornier got straight to the point, telling Ella she would like her to attend the Grand Duke's investiture ceremony in two days. Well, I really doubt Ella would agree to go, but then again, would she turn down a request from the Marchioness? Ella welcomed Marchioness Ornier into her home and served her a cup of tea. She explained that she had already informed Sir Gilbert of her decision to attend the investiture ceremony. Lisbeth Ornier, however, pleaded with her to reconsider, saying the Grand Duke was eagerly awaiting her presence. She placed the teacup on the table, adding that she too was looking forward to seeing Ella. Ella then shocked Lisbeth with her question. Is the reason you're inviting me related to fulfilling the Emperor's wishes? She went on to claim that the Emperor wanted her to marry Cassius and that the invitation was meant to bring them together for this purpose. Cassius and I are over, Marchioness, she said with a sigh. Ella continued expressing her struggles. I don't know what it's like to raise a daughter alone and I've just managed to settle into this village. My daughter is beginning to smile again. Even if we were to join the noble society, would we still be this happy? Hmm, truth be told, if she's to accept the Duke, more gossip is likely to come up, and it will really not be funny. Ella added that she didn't want her daughter to feel isolated. Lisbeth listened quietly, and then with a smile, admitted she had misjudged the situation and wouldn't try to persuade her further. Ah, oh, but you and the Grand Duke are in a very complex political situation right now, Lisbeth said. Ella asked if there were nobles trying to undermine his position. Lisbeth nodded, confirming that Ella was correct. She explained that the Grand Duke of Heilwig wields extraordinary power and bows to no one except the Emperor. This has made other nobles fearful, worried that the Grand Duke might threaten their own power. That's quite intense. This might make Ella reconsider, but then again, is she ready to be ungrateful to the doctor as her mother had warned her against? Lisbeth stopped and said it was too soon to discuss the matter further. She stood up, apologized for the intrusion, and expressed hope that they could converse in a more comfortable setting next time. She added that Ella need not attend the ceremony. As Ella watched the Marchioness leave, she couldn't help but think to herself that Lisbeth was too kind. Is she on my side? She wondered. When Greta saw the lady leave, she came over to her mom, smiling and asking what the lady had said. Ella lifted her daughter onto her lap and told her about the invitation to an event. Greta, curious, asked what an event was. Ella explained, an event is a party where many people gather to celebrate something. Greta's eyes sparkled with curiosity, and she asked if it was like a birthday party. I want to go too, she said happily. Ella squeezed Greta's hands and gently said they couldn't go. Poor girl. She must feel disappointed that she can't even attend an event. So guys, there is more to discover in this manhwa, but this is where this part of the story ends. If you love the story to continue, please comment the name Ella. See you guys in the next one.